All right, welcome everybody. We're gonna begin our next tour, which will be of the Assistive Technology Center. Give me just one moment while I change something on my share. Hello, my name is Anna Bazaha, and I'm a research and education librarian at The Ohio State University Health Sciences Library. I am talking today with Dr. Carmen DeGiovene, who is a clinical professor in the OSU School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences. He is also a certified assistive technology professional, seating and mobility specialist, and rehabilitation engineering technologist, as well as the curriculum director of the Assistive Technology Certificate Program and the Director of Rehabilitation Science and Technology at the OSU Wexner Medical Center Assistive Technology Center. Today, Carmen will be walking us through a 360 virtual tour of the Assistive Technology Center. So thanks, Anna, for that introduction. Um, and it's great to have everybody here at the uh, a virtual version of the Assistive Technology Center. Uh, the Assistive Technology Center is what I call a living lab. Um, it is primarily designed um, to support individuals with disabilities that use assistive technology. So we have occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech language pathologists um, that work here a lot with myself as a rehabilitation engineer that work here um, to look at how can we use mainstream technology and assistive technology to, to support individuals. And what we'll do here today is we're gonna provide you a tour of the Assistive Technology Center. So what you're looking at right now is you're primarily looking at our wheelchair clinic. And you'll notice that there's power wheelchairs in the foreground. There's some manual wheelchairs in the background. There's a bunch of seat cushions and back supports in the background. Um, and then in the middle, you might see some railings. Those are the diamond plate uh, ramps that we, diamond plate surfaces that we have to represent wrap ramps and curb drops and to get people a lot of people to have the experience of using um, wheelchairs in a real world environment so i think uh, our next uh, step is we're going to click on the uh, power wheelchair video and take a look at some of the technology um, that we use in the clinic on a daily basis Welcome back to the Assistive Technology Center. I want to talk to you a little bit about the different types of scooters and power wheelchairs that we use here at the AT Center. First, I'll start off with scooters. In this case, we have a three wheel scooter. Two wheels in the back, one wheel up front. There's a motor in the back that drives the rear wheels, and then we have the tiller that controls the front wheels. So first thing I'll do, get in the scooter, demonstrate how it works, put the arm down, turn the scooter on, wait for it to start up. So this type of device is really good for somebody who has good postural control, maybe can stand on their own, but can't go long distances. The second type of wheelchair I wanna to talk to you about is a front wheel drive wheelchair. So this is an example of a front wheel drive wheelchair because the wheels are up front. This is considered a group three wheelchair, which means it's designed for people who are using their wheelchair every day, all day long. This wheelchair also has seating features built into it. So I'll demonstrate some of those seating features. So this is the tilt function. This allows me to tilt the wheelchair. Great thing about a tilt wheelchair, once you get over the fact that you're at 50 degrees with the ground, is that it really takes all the weight off of your butt, off your ischial tuberosity. So it's great for pressure relieving. It's also great to use gravity to pull you back into the seating system. 
The next wheelchair I'd like to demonstrate for you is a mid-wheel wheelchair. So you have two wheels up front, two wheels in back, or two casters up front, two casters in back, and the drive wheel in the middle. This wheelchair also has all of the seating features that the previous wheelchair had. So it can tilt, it can recline, it has seat elevated. One of the nice things about a mid-wheel drive wheelchair relative to front-wheel drive or rear-wheel drive is that you typically have tighter turning radius and you turn, the wheels are turning right below your head, so it feels more natural. See you later. One last power wheelchair that I want to show you is a Group 2 power wheelchair. The Group 3 wheelchairs are designed for everyday use indoors and outdoor environments. Group 2 are designed predominantly for indoor use. Though some people will take them outdoors, they really only work on sidewalks and level surfaces. So this is a Group 2 wheelchair. You can tell that because it's got a smaller drive wheel, smaller casters in the front, and smaller casters in the back, and they don't have as much shock absorption or suspension built into them. So welcome back to the Assistive Technology Center. Uh, that video gives you a representation of the types of things that we talk about, not only with students who are going through our assistive and rehabilitative technology certificate program, but more importantly, the types of things that we're going through with patients who are coming to our outpatient facility. One of the things that we really focus on and that we think is really important is that the consumer or the client or the patient, the individual with the disability has a chance to try out all of the different equipment. Um, because it's like buying a new pair of shoes. You wanna try out those new shoes before, because you're gonna be using them for the next couple of years. Well, for individuals who are getting wheelchairs, a wheelchair, typically they're using them for five or more years. So it's important that they have a chance to, to play with the equipment to test it out and to see what it is really like for them because many of the for many of them this is their their first time experience so i think we're gonna um pan to the right to the manual wheelchair section and while we're doing that um i'll just talk about the fact that um we do have a scale in our clinic which actually seems quite simple um, but it's really important because some of these power wheelchairs that you just saw weigh 350 to 400 pounds by themselves. So if you have a large individual that also weighs 300 pounds, you're putting 700 pounds um, into a vehicle, onto a ramp. And, and that's an important thing to consider um, as we're trying to figure out how a wheelchair is going to fit not only the individual, but fit into that individual's life. So now we'll transition to uh, the manual wheelchair video. Hi, and welcome back to the Assistive Technology Center. I want to talk to you a little bit about manual wheelchairs so you get a sense of the type of equipment that we use here at the AT Center. First off, I have a lightweight manual wheelchair. Though it's called what lightweight, it really isn't that very light. This is probably 40 to 50 pounds, but it's what we call a lightweight wheelchair. And it's a folding frame wheelchair. So I'm able to take it, fold it up to get it into a vehicle or get it into a small space and then unfold it. You can always tell that you have a folding frame wheelchair because of the cross brace underneath it. Turning it sideways, we have mag wheels, they're a little bit heavier, and we have solid tires. These are great for rolling on tile, but not so good for rolling outdoors. And for this wheelchair, it's only, the wheel is only adjustable in the vertical direction, up and down. Can't move it forward and back. The second wheelchair I'd like to talk about is another folding frame wheelchair, but this is considered an ultralight wheelchair. It's very lightweight, very easy to unfold. Once again, you can see it has a cross brace underneath the seat. So that's how we know it's a folding frame wheelchair. If I turn this wheelchair sideways, 
some of the features that it has on it. Swing away and removable leg rest. Quick release wheel to make it easy to get the rear wheel off. Wheel locks, all wheelchairs have wheel locks. And finally, this wheel is adjustable up and down, forward and back. That's important for increased, making it easier for an individual to grab onto the hand grip as they're propelling the wheelchair. It also makes it easier to get more weight on the rear wheels because the rear wheels have a lower rolling resistance than the front wheels. So it makes it easier to get around. So that's our ultra light folding wheelchair. Next. So as you heard me talking through all these different uh, types of manual wheelchairs and power wheelchairs, you probably get the sense that that's probably one of the largest uh, areas of the Assistive Technology Center. And, and you'd be right. Um, seating and wheel mobility is the largest uh, service area that we have. Um, one of the things that I um, want to point out is just the importance of the evaluation. Um, and you're going to hear that in the uh, in the next video, as we start talking about the evaluation, I like to talk about it from the standpoint of um, engineers. You know, I'm a rehabilitation engineer. My, my educational background is in biomedical engineering. And the goal is to really identify what the issue is, what the problem is. And, and we work with the, uh, we work with the clients, with the consumers. And, and you're hearing me use the term client consumer because oftentimes we interchange them with patient because we believe that the patient, and in this case, the consumer, is part of the evaluation process. And so in, in the video right now, you can see two mat tables, two large mat tables, um, one on the right that has a blue mat or um, cushion on it, and then the one on the left with the gray one, and there's also a Hoyer lift in there. Um, this is where we give the person an opportunity, to, we have the person get, if they're using a wheelchair currently, get out of their wheelchair so we can see what their posture is like. How are they sitting um, outside the wheelchair? And then that helps us build the wheelchair around the individual. And that this concept of having the individual at the center of the process is important in our educational training or our educational courses, in our clinic, and for our research activities. So now I think we're going to go to the um, video that looks at our evaluation process. I want to provide an overview of the assessment process. The assessment process includes the analysis of the individual, the activities they want to perform, and the context in which they will perform the activities. In this video, we are focusing on the assessment for a new power wheelchair. The assistive technology professional, in this case, a clinician at the Assistive Technology Center, is utilizing what we would consider low-tech rehabilitation technology to, to measure an individual's anatomical measurements. Likewise, if we were to focus on selecting a seat cushion, we could use a pressure mapping system, which is considered high-tech rehabilitation technology to analyze the effectiveness of a seat cushion. The use of rehabilitation technology in conjunction with a thorough interview are the foundation for recommending appropriate assistive technology. In this case, an individual has just received a power wheelchair and the assistive technology professional is training the individual on the proper use of the power seating system and configuring the head support based on their anatomical measurements. These anatomical measurements were recorded during the assessment. Quantitative measurements and interviewing skills are the foundation to identify the primary activity that the individual wants to perform. All of these measures are critical to increasing the likelihood of a successful outcome. This video demonstrates the importance of the assessment process and the use of rehabilitation technology in order to identify and configure assistive technology that will allow the individual with a disability to perform activities at home and in the community. So we always say that the technology is only as good as the strategies to use the technology. 
the people that are involved in the evaluation and implementation process, and the overall service delivery process and the measurements that we take during that service delivery process. And so the next thing that we have for you is video is about the workshop. And this is one of the things that I think is um, innovative. And you may not think that a workshop is, is innovative. Um, and in some environments it's not, but to actually get it in the clinical setting is extremely innovative. And the reason it is, is because we work closely with the wheelchair suppliers and the wheelchair manufacturers that actually deliver the equipment to the, to the individual. And by having a workshop in house, we're able to make, we're able to actually have all the people, you will, um, all the people who are involved in the process at the evaluation and at the implementation. And we're working together to make sure that the final outcome looks and feels and acts in the same way that we had imagined during the evaluation. In other models, people will take the equipment, take it back to a shop and outside of the healthcare center and then bring it back. And so there's a lot of wasted time and energy going back and forth. And that's the most important for the individual with a disability because that extra time can be very prohibitive in terms of their overall mobility. And it's just a pain for them to keep coming back and forth to the medical, medical center. So we try to be as efficient as possible. And so this next vi video is gonna demonstrate some of those, um, some of the tools that we use every day when we're fitting the wheelchair to the individual. Hi, and welcome back to the Assistive Technology Center. I wanna show you a different part of the AT Center. This is the part that focuses on the rehabilitation technology tools that we use in the clinic. I've got a couple examples here that I wanna show you. They range from low-tech devices to high-tech devices. First off, I'll start with some of the low-tech devices. I've just got a standard yardstick here. This is very useful for measuring people's linear dimensions. So leg length. I have a tape measure. Usually we like rigid tape measures that are less flexible as opposed to soft tape measures. It gives us better measurements. If you want to get a little fancier, we use anthropometers. anthropometers. Um, these are devices that measure linear lengths but have um, prongs on the end of them to make it easier to take measurements. We use these to measure things such as hip, hip width or chest width when we're deciding what the dimension should be on a manual wheelchair or power wheelchair. Another way we use a yardstick is we use a yardstick like this that can measure the seat height of a wheelchair. Sometimes we'll use a goniometer. Goniometers are great for measuring angles. Angles of the person as well as angles of the wheelchair. So in this case, I can get the angle of my hip width and I can use that and translate that into the angle of the seat to back angle for a manual wheelchair. Another low tech solution is a measuring wheel. This is a wheel that we can measure out the distances when we're looking at the capacity of an individual to walk or propel a wheelchair. And finally, for low-tech tools, we have an assortment of hand tools that we use in the clinic, such as Allen wrenches, screwdrivers, hammers, socket wrenches. This allows us to adjust the wheelchairs to match the individual dimensions of the person. So moving up the scale to something that's a little bit more advanced is something as simple as a camera. Now most people aren't using a camera like this, they're using their phones, but either way, they work great to document how a person is using a device and to document the setup once you get that device positioned in the right way. Finally, some high-tech solutions that we have or some high-tech rehabilitation technology that we have First one is the smart wheel. The smart wheel measures the forces a person uses when propelling a wheelchair. So we put this wheel on their manual wheelchair. Very similar to the concept 
of using a force plate when a per in the ground when a person is walking on the ground. The other tool we use is a pressure mapping system. So it's just a mat that we place on the seating surface under the individual. We have them sit on it. That allows us to measure the pressures in between the person and the cushion. The goal is that we keep away the high pressures or we lower the pressure so that we minimize the likelihood of a person developing a pressure ulcer. The final piece of equipment that I don't have here with me is over in the other corner of the room is a scale. And that scale is great for two things. One, it gives us the weight of the wheelchair and the weight of the person. But if we only put two wheels on the scale, then we can get the weight distribution. Because as we'll talk about later in the, seat, or in the mobility section, you want to get the majority of the weight on the rear wheels for the individual who's using a manual wheelchair. So at this point, you've gotten a good sense of the entire uh, service delivery process that we provide at the Assistive Technology Center. So we start with a referral, often from a physician. Then we work through the evaluation process, working with the individual. It's very patient-centered or client-centered. It's an interprofessional process with occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech-language pathologists, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, um, the suppliers and the manufacturers. And we work through the process from evaluation to imp implementation and fitting and follow along. And it really is the process is important to us. And the reason is, is because we're also very focused on patient satisfaction, client satisfaction, and outcomes. We think that that's the most important part is the actual outcome. And we've learned that by not having everybody involved, having an interprofessional team, we don't get the outcomes that we expect. So I focused a lot on seating and wheel mobility. Uh, I'd like to take you to the through the rest of the lab, and we're going to take a little bounce over to the demo lab which really is a, not a, a demolition lab, just to be clear, it's a demonstration lab. And so we have a demonstration lab. These are um, our electronic cognitive devices. So in the good old days, some of you may know of the Palm Pilot. Those were the original electronic cognitive devices. They're just um, information managers. And now we have our smartphones. So individuals that may have a head injury or have a developmental disability um, may use something like that. It's also our smart technology lab, our smart home technology lab. So your Amazon Alexa, your um, Google Home, any of those types of devices that control or technologies that control devices in your home, um, people can evaluate and use. And we can actually control those devices from power wheelchairs now. So there's a lot of integration that's going on. And so that's something that we focus on. The, other area that um, I just want to talk quickly about is augmentative and alternative communication. Some people call it uh, speech generating devices, um, or you may hear the term AAC. And so for somebody who isn't able to talk, for sometimes it's short periods of time while they're in a acute care medical se setting um, because they have a trach, and so they're not able to talk, they can use a device that's very similar to a smartphone or a tablet that has a keyboard on it and it creates a synthesized or digitized voice for them. Um, for individuals with a developmental disability who um, are not able to communicate with their voice, they can use them to not only create a voice for themselves, but also to connect to the internet um, and to connect to their computer. So it serves multiple, multiple purposes. And so that's where I talked earlier about speech language pathologists. That's where they have an important role in all of this. And then the last thing I'll talk about is um, those three toolboxes to the left um, that are on, on top of the cabinets. And then there's a whole bunch of stuff underneath there. Those are switches, joysticks, um, joystick controllers. If you think about the adaptive Xbox controller, expanded keyboards. So we have a number of different ways for individuals with physical disabilities to access computers. And I bring all this up because just because of the importance of this is just not about the clinic itself and the education, but it's also the research. And the research that happens here, this is really a living lab. And so we're not doing, we're not um, oftentimes 
completing research that focuses on um, prospective studies. But really, we're looking at research that is retrospective in, na in nature, looking at the outcomes. And we're very focused on that. So we use an instrument called the Functional Mobility Assessment. And it allows us to have an outcome of over a thousand individuals coming through our clinic so that we can see are the services that we're providing working. And then the research part, so that's the quality improvement part. The research part is we need to disseminate this information out into the out into the community so that other clinics can learn from us. I will finish today with the fact that um, we've really had this transition over the past 18 months. And so the two monitors and the microphone and keyboard that are in front of the screen right there is our telehealth station. Now, the interesting thing is that these videos were taken long before the pandemic started. And we were thankfully ahead of the game in terms of telehealth, trying to um, get a better handle of how we can use telehealth. And what we learned, and this is the research and the quality improvement side of it, what we learned is that telehealth works in an assistive technology program environment by having a hybrid version. So we learned from it that people still need to come in the clinic for the evaluation, but then we can do some of the follow-up activities at home. And that's important because not only does it remove the amount of time and effort it takes to get to the clinic, to get to the center-based clinic, but it also allows more caregivers, more stakeholders to be involved in the process because they may be in an individual's home environment. So just to wrap up today, you've gotten a tour, a virtual tour of the Assistive Technology Center. The Assistive Technology Center is an interprofessional group. Uh, it was started about 15 years ago, primarily by Teresa Berner, who's an occupational therapist and is the manager. She runs the Assistive Technology Center. My role really is that person that focuses on how do we bring in education? How do we bring in um, research? And how do I support the quality improvement initiatives within the, within the clinic? And this gives you an idea of some of the technology um, that is available for people with disabilities. So I, I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you recognize it's not just about the shiny objects, but it really is about the people and it's really about the processes that we have in place. Thank you, Carmen, for that great tour of the Assistive Technology Center. Um, I just wanted to wrap up with a last few questions. Um, so do you get visits from classes or non-OSU visitors? Sure, yeah, we, um, we do get visits from classes. We get requests um, from both the health sciences uh, courses or from some of the health sciences classes. And we also get them from the engineering classes. And we typically do those at the end of the day. So the beauty of, of having a living lab is that people actually get to see what does a clinical space look like. The downside is we oftentimes have to do the tours after hours um, because it is a clinical space. And we have many patients who are, are coming through our facility throughout, throughout the day. The, the beauty of the online environment is we've been able to do more and more um, recordings online so that people can see what it looks like on, the, on their own time. Um, you talked about this a little bit during the tour, but what are you most known for and how do you measure success? Yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, it's it's always challenge, challenging to say what you're most known for because that means you have to kind of think back of how are other people looking at you. but from what we've heard, one of the things that we're most known for is that um, is that interprofessional collaboration, and the um, the fact that we have this good process of how to work as a team to make sure we're meeting the needs of the individual. And the way that it goes to that quality improvement, we measure how long does it typically take for an individual to get a wheelchair. Um, and nationally, we're on the low end of that time that it takes. Um, and it's still really too long. It's, it's on the order of 70 to 90 days to go from evaluation to the time a person's getting a wheelchair, partly because of the insurance process. But that's the thing. We've got a great process. We do it well. We focus on it. 
and we have a great group of people that are working with us. Um, how do the people here use library resources and or services? You know, that that's my favorite question. Um, in, in, in preparing for today, um, it's, it's amazing. So one of the things very tangibly that we do is every month we have an assistive, we call it the assistive technology grand rounds just to make it sound fancy, but it's, it's one of the clinicians or one of the people that we work with on um, one of the manufacturers um, coming into the clinic and talking about a topic that they're passionate about. Uh, one may be about how to use that pressure mapping system that I talked about earlier. And the thing that we're doing is, um, we're always talking, the first thing we always talk about is what's the evidence out there? And that's that's the thing that everybody, we're, we're all turning into clinician scientists because we're able to access that information so easily that it that wasn't possible even, even 10 years ago. And that information is is the literature and not only accessing it, but how do you how do you use it? So the group that I work with are not, we're not trained researchers, we're trained clinicians, and and yet we're we're going to the health science library to get that information and to use the information. The other thing is in training students, um, we're always talking about scoping reviews and systematic reviews. And the uh, I call them lib guides. I know there's different names for different uh, different areas, but we rely on those lib guides to really give that structure so that the students know how to do it. And now what we're finding is the students are actually teaching the clinicians. And next week we're presenting at a conference about a scoping review on ultralight wheelchairs that, and I'm not even presenting one of the clinicians. So it, it's that type of stuff that is just so valuable to us. That's great. Um, last question, what would be your biggest want for this facility? My biggest want for the facility, I, you know what, we, we've got it pretty good. Um, and, you know, we've got the right people, we've got the, the right, you know, I, I guess my biggest want would just be a little bit more space. Um, and actually, I take that back. My biggest want is I'd rather be on the first floor. Um, I don't know if that will ever happen, but right now we're on the third floor. And for um, for individuals who use wheel, the majority of people that we provide service to are individuals who use wheelchairs. And the other program that I didn't mention is our driver's rehab program. And so it's challenging for people to get on the elevators. The elevators are slow sometimes. Sometimes they break down. It'd be really nice if we were on the first floor. Um, and for our driver's rehab program, it's just a pain to have to always go up to the third floor to register it and, and come back down. So that from a facility standpoint, you know, that's if, if I was um, to, to ask for anything I could, that would be it. Um, Cause I like, we're, we're off, we're off the main campus, the main medical center campus, um, which is great. Cause it makes it easy for people to get to our facility. So I, I wouldn't change our location at all. Great. Well, thank you so much for giving us a tour of the facility, and we look forward to the live Q&A session during the Great Lakes Science Boot Camp. So we will see you then. Thank you very much, Anna. All right, so thank you all for watching the video. We have Carmen here, who I believe has been fielding some questions in the chat as we went, and we will continue with the Q&A for another 10 minutes or so. Before we start that, um, I did wanna ask if everybody who is a presenter during the lightning talks coming up, if you can just raise your hand so that you come up to the top of the participant list um, for, for Danny to see, um, we would appreciate it. And then, I'm going to, I believe Carmen has been answering some of the questions, so I need to kind of get caught up on where we are. Unless Carmen, do you know what question you were on? I think I caught up to all of them um, and provided a little additional information um, for a lot of them. A lot of great questions focused on, uh, um, some of them focused on I think what was best practices, there was a question about pediatrics and that one was fun one to feel, fun one to field um, because there's a position paper on that currently um, on the Resna website. 
and there's a lot of position papers um, that basically are, you know, they start out as scoping reviews or literature reviews and then turn into position papers based on new and evolving area that clinicians are interested in. Um, and then Rebecca asked about the, I think it was Rebecca asked about the, um, the virtual environment. Um, and so I put that link in the chat. If you want to check out the virtual environment on your own, it's the one that starts with osu.ir360.com. Supposedly you can use um, a real virtual headset with it. Um, I've never tried that, but um, be cool to play with. I mean, I had a lot of help with that too. I did not do that. That's, yeah, that's beyond my capacity. I know one thing that I learned about that I thought was interesting, and I don't know if you can talk a little bit more about, was the different, you mentioned in one of the videos, the different groups of wheelchairs. Um, you mentioned like group one and group two, I believe. Could you talk a little bit more about like what those differences are? I'm not sure if you've already addressed that in the chat. No, no, actually I haven't uh, addressed that question and, and I'll address it on um, a, a couple different levels. Um, you know, group, Group one power wheelchairs and then group two power wheelchairs are, are mainly indoor, designed for indoor environments. Group three gets in the indoor outdoor environment. And then group four is primarily outdoor. So somebody asked me about the uh, outdoor environment. And I put a link to, um, to uh, a uh, wheelchair manufacturer down in, in Australia. Um, and then there's another one, a new um, company called Action Tracker action track wheelchair um, that just came on the market that is definitely designed for um, the outdoor environment and that's group four. But then when you start getting to the equity component of it, um, uh, Met Centers for Medicare and Medicaid um, only recognize wheelchairs that are designed for indoor environments. So that's where you start to, it, it starts to get challenging um, in a clinic. Um, on the manual wheelchair side, you basically have light standard wheelchairs in the home or that you'd see in the hospital, uh, lightweight wheelchairs, and then ultralight wheelchairs. And, and at this point in time, we, we primarily focus on ultralight wheelchairs because they allow the greatest adjustability because um, it's all about matching the person to, to the technology. Great, thanks. Um, I also was curious if you could talk a little bit more. We didn't get to watch the video that talked about and demonstrated some of the um, elect different electronic devices that are available. You mentioned integrating with things like Alexa and Google Home and things like that. What is What are some of the other electronic devices that um, you have there in that demo lab? Yeah, so um, we, we have your traditional um, Google, uh, Alexa and Apple products. Um, but then there's some companies that specialize in, in uh, developing products specifically for individuals with disabilities. Um, and a company like that is, is AbleNet. And there's a company in uh, Europe that's escaping my, my brain brainwaves right now. But, um, but there are a few companies that do that. The, the biggest thing that we focus on is not acquiring the equipment, is how can people um, uh, how, how do they integrate them together? That's what the thing, and then how do they use that? So somebody can, can actually run some of that equipment, some can run a TV, can run the lights in their home using the joystick on their power wheelchair, for example, if that's their best control interface. So we're really focused on how do you integrate those pieces and parts, not do you, how do you go out to um, Best Buy or Amazon and, and, and buy, buy them, but because it really is um, a little bit like the wild, wild west, and the other conversation we have with them is privacy um, and bandwidth and electricity and some of the um, lower level things um, that you have to make sure, lower level meaning some of the infra infrastructure that you have to make sure is in place um, for that individual and that they're comfortable with that. Um, I see a, a question in the chat from Jan, uh, do you assist people who design group four wheelchairs or those outdoor wheelchairs um, in, interesting. No, we don't directly um, work with them, but uh, what ends up often in their design process, 
but what ends up happening is um, like action. The reason that action track chair came to mind is because they're coming out to our facility in a couple of weeks to do um, a demo. Let us see what their new wheelchair looks like. Let us play with it and um, and get a sense of of how it it potentially differentiates itself from other products uh, that are are currently on the market. And then we always give them feedback, and so they're all, they're constantly reiterating their products, and so we give them feedback on the, the different iterations of their, their product. Um, the one group that I'll highlight is um, there's a group out of the University of Pittsburgh and their sole focus is on the design of assistive technology because the marketplace tends to be smaller. They don't, the assistive technology doesn't typically get the same venture capital or funding that fancier um, or more uh, mainstream technologies get. And so that they focus on that. And so a lot of manufacturers will go to them for support on the design and development of um, assistive technology. We have time for probably one or two more questions if people have them to put them in. If there's no more questions, I'll just put out there from a professional organization standpoint. Um, I'm, I, I'm president elect for RESNA, which is uh, the Rehab Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America. So um, if you're interested in this field uh, and learning more and uh, collaborating um, besides finding uh, centers like ours in your own universities and colleges, um, it's also a great place to go is uh, resna.org, R-E-S-N-A dot org oh man that's a great uh, eric that's a great question uh, that we are running out of the short answer is actually we don't um and that's uh we don't partner directly and that's partly because um we're on the medical center side as opposed to the academic side so that's the short answer long answer is uh we're always collab we're, we're not officially collaborating but we're always collaborating and always sharing ideas i guess they're both short answers but but yeah, great question. All right, well, great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Carmen. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed the tour and I believe we will be moving right into the lightning talks. Um, no break this time. And so if you have any other questions, you can follow up with us after, after um, the boot camp. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great questions today. Well, as we go into the, um, the lightning talks, uh, I'm going to put into the chat a link for dot storming. Um, this is how we are going to kind of run a People's Choice Award uh, for our lightning talk speakers. Um, and I apologize, I am the only one in my library right now. Uh, so maybe Danny, you can put that link in the chat because I, I, I have a student who needs something at my circulation desk. Sure, I'll put that in. Um, I'm actually going to stop recording and then start recording. Ian, hold on just a moment.